it is a true honor for me to be uh, presenting today in, in uh, uh, through the Pulver Taft Hand Center. And thanks for allowing me to speak about my favorite subject, which is the distal radius fracture. So this is my disclosure. And the most common fracture that we orthopedists treat on the human skeleton is the distal radius fracture. And over the last several years, the most commonly performed operative procedure for distal radius fracture is a volar locking plate. And the reason is that the patients have told us that they do very well. We could compare the results with the other treatment methods we had in the pre previous years, and there was no question that this was a move forward. Now, that doesn't mean there are not other ways of treating distal radius fractures, and we should know them all. We should have all these instruments in our um, bag of tricks because you need them many times when you're not expecting. The interest that humanity has had in the distal radius fracture is as old, old as history itself. There's a 5,000 year old uh, manuscript from Egypt describing how to treat distal radius fractures. And basically they do pretty much what we do now. We pull on the fingers, we apply uh, splints made of wood and linen, and then they would harden this uh, material with something made with grease and honey which of course I have no idea what the chemistry of that, but this is some, this is, has been going on for 5,000 years. We still do the same thing. We still treat many of our patients conservatively, particularly the elderly patient, the low demand patient tolerates deformity very well. There is some limit to how much deformity patients are willing to tolerate, but many patients tolerate a lot of deformity. Not so the young patients and not so the patients that involve periarticular fractures. And in the 1950s, 1960s, the AO group came around and told us that if we were able to fix fractures with rigid internal fixation, and they would be stable enough that we could start early rehabilitation, then we would prevent this problem called cast disease, which was really stiffness, and the patients would do much better. No better place in the human body to demonstrate the advantages of this technique than in the forearm. Um, uh, the forearm is just one joint with uh, uh, two condyles, the proximal and the distal radial nerve joint. And every time we had a both bone fractures, the results were not perfect when we treat them conservatively. But since we started fixing them with the AO technique, our results have greatly improved. Now, when we tried to apply this to the upper to the uh, distal radius fracture, we all of a sudden found that it did not work well because we did not have rigid stable fixation to manage the the metaphyseal uh, uh, aspect of the distal radius. <clears throat> if you had a patient that was young and healthy and the fracture was simple, you could get away with applying a dorsal buttress plate. That's all we had in the early days, just buttress plates but they failed very often because these, these fractures would collapse, they would shorten, and the, the patients would not get the results we wanted. So I was a fellow, this was one of my cases when I was a fellow, and my professor, Dr. Burkhalter, after I did three of these, looked at me straight into the eye, and he was a military man, and he told me, George, don't you ever do that again. And believe me, for many years, I had no intentions of treating a distal radius fracture with a plate ever again. But <clears throat> times change. And we did have, at that time, a dogma. Dorsal fractures were treated from the dorsal side, palmar fractures from the palmar side because of the buttress effect. But this uh, group, Hill Hastings and Jesse Jupiter, came out with the pie plate. And the pie plate was the first locking plate to be designed for distal radius fractures. It had a lot of problems. It was a dorsal plate. It had to be cut to size. There was an um, epidemic of tendon ruptures a year after it was introduced. So we quickly gave it up. And the problem is that in the dorsal aspect, the extensor tendons are in contact with the bone surface along their whole length. But in the volar aspect, the flexor tendons of the bone surface are well separated by that concavity. 
the pronator fossa, and there's a muscle in between. So we can apply a lot of internal fixation palmarly without problems. And in the very same set as the pie plate came was a little T plate that had fixed angle options. It had been designed for volar fractures. The designers still believed in the dogma, but these um, pegs had no threads. They would thread into the plate, would um, spark the idea that um, changed the way we treat distal radius fractures because it gave us the concept that we could actually treat a volar fracture, uh, I'm sorry, a dorsal fracture from the volar side thanks to these plates. And this is one of these examples. In 1997, I went over my trauma as a fellow and I used one of these little volar T plates and the results were spectacular. I knew since the first one I did that there was something about this technique. Unfortunately, this plate was poorly designed. It wasn't designed to fix dorsal fractures from the volar side. It had a lot of uh, problems, fractures. We had to cast them. So my group decided let's improve these volar plates. So we designed our first volar plate designed for dorsal fractures. We call it the H plate. There was only one plate that should fit every human being. If you had a right-sided fracture, you use these four holes. If you had a left-sided fracture, you would use those four holes, trying to maintain that tangential support of the articular surface. Terrible plate. Very soon afterwards, we decided, okay, let's not be cheap. Let's make right and left plates that fit better. And that was the biodynamics plate. And soon after, the, the problem with the biodynamics plate is we had identified the three main problems. Strength, because dorsal fractures being treated from the volar side, the, the plate has to withstand 100% of the load. The fixed angle elements had to be inclined distally. So they would support the dorsal aspect of the subchondral bone as these fractures are mostly dorsally displaced and they wanted to collapse back into dorsal displacement. But very importantly, they also had a volar buttressing surface. The majority of these fractures were unstable in two directions. So we used the pegs to support the dorsal instability and the volar buttressing surface to support the palmar instability. And then the, the DVR was born. That was the first commercially available plate. It changed uh, shape many times. Uh, Dr. Diego Fernandez and myself published uh, the first series in uh, 2002. And through these years, the volar plate still has been evolving, changing, and changing because nothing is ever perfect and there's always room for improvement. What has not changed is the fact that fixed angle fixation is key. Fixed angle fixation is not only that the screws are locking screws, but they also thread into the, 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 the screw threads into the plate and guides the surgeon by the hand to be able to reproduce that perfect subchondral support. That is key to stabilize the more comminuted and fragmented articular surfaces. So we learned something about fixation. So the lunate fossa is certainly the most difficult part. They tend to displace dorsally and to separate the dorsal and the palmar fragments. So if you incline the fixed angle elements uh, more than the plane formed by the dorsal aspect of the bone, then as the, as the lunate loads, instead of producing a, a vertical uh, vector, the net resulting force of that more inclined plane is palmar. So this configuration tends to capture the dorsal fragments against the volar buttressing surface that work very well. But we had to incline those screws significantly, which left the volar fragments unsupported. So in the old days, it was not uncommon to see that volar fragment tilt dorsally. Somewhere around 2004, um, the, there was an, uh, the introduction of the second row of fixed angle elements distal to the first, but more transverse, so we could then stabilize the, the volar fragment better. Still, there was a lot of work to be done because that volar fragment is a mirror image of the dorsal fragment. It acts like an inclined plane. It tends to displace palmarly, and it's stable only if the fragment is large 
and the volar buttressing surface of the plate is sufficient to support it. But you cannot support all these volar fragments because the watershed line is that uh, anatomical concept that <clears throat> limits the distal extent of where you can apply a plate because the flexor tendons actually do come in contact with the bone surface at the watershed line. And if you are not careful, you can injure your flexor tendons by placing hardware prominently down here. At the level of the lunate fossa, the watershed line is very close to the joint. It's about three millimeters proximal to the joint. And because plates have thickness, they are not infinitely thin, you have to place the plate proximal to the watershed line, more or less two millimeters. And that means that any fragment that is five millimeters or less has absolutely no support. And these are the ones that get us into trouble. These are the ones that we call volar marginal fragments. They displace palmarly and the whole carpus follows them and they end up in big disasters. So it's this short volar lunate fragment, the troublemaker. And we were able to find a solution for that a few years ago with the hook plate. And this is a decision that is made intraoperatively. When you apply the plate and you realize my volar surface is not going to buttress my volar lunate fragment. And then you extend the buttressing surface of the plate by using this little hook plate. So these are my, my 10 tips and tricks of how to treat distal radius fractures. Number one, you have to know your opponent. Half of these fractures are articular. The loading on the articular surface is not um, symmetric. On the scaphoid fossa, the centroid of force application is in the center of the scaphoid fossa, but on the lunate fossa, the centroid of force application is all the way palmar. And the anatomy of these fragments that result from uh, articular displacement are quite variable, but there's a pattern to it. And this is a study by Sunis and Ring, in which they did a heat map, or red is high probability of the presence of a fracture line, blue is low probability of a presence of a fracture line. And they looked at multiple CAT scans, came up with this. <clears throat> Basically, it's a cross section. And, and if you notice, the volar lunate fragment is the largest and the most constant one. The scaphoid fragment is usually the most displaced and it's a significantly large one. And the dorsal lunate fragment is small and many times is not much displaced. So the high incidence of fracture occurs on a cross manner. And it doesn't mean that the fracture has a cross shape. It means that the there are two options to the fracture lines. Either the lunate fossa is split vertically and the fracture line exits ulnar to Lister's tubercle, or very often the, the uh, fraction line directs itself radially and exits at the floor of the second compartment, leaving a very long dorsal uh, fragment that encompasses part of the scaphoid fossa. So this, this would be the two more, more common fracture patterns, and we must keep them in mind where we're fixing these fractures. Something about biomechanics and anatomy, we know that the scaphoid fossa has two well-developed columns of spongy bone that hold the articular surface in space. And this is something that Gregory Bain uh, described. But the lunate fossa has only one well-developed column. And when there's a fracture, because the, the center of, low, of force application is on that volar fragment, and the volar fragment is offset from the radial shaft, very often we have this type of instability that is so difficult to treat. Trick number two, indicate correctly. Yes, we can treat many of these conservatively and they do well, but the young patients with the intraticular fractures are the ones that benefit most from a stable fixation. This is a 30-something a year old uh, um, um, uh, roller blader that three months post-op is very happy because she's exactly back to what she used to do before. In fact, she could do a push-up uh, test from her examining table at three months after her fracture, which was interesting. But the older patients, the more osteoporotic patients also benefit like this extremely displaced 
raised articular fragment in a 90-something-year-old osteoporotic patient. If we're able to support that articular surface in space, no matter how common it is, if we hold it in space, the patients end up getting back to their lives rapidly and they regain the function that they need. And one of the benefits in the elderly people is that they, many of them, they're alone, they have to take care of themselves. And they, they might even have to use uh, uh, ambulatory aids and they can really go back very quickly if you get that stable fixation. Trick number three, you have to go further. We're not making a competition of small incisions. I think that is foolish. What we want to do is to solve the patient's problem. The Henry approach does not cross the flexion creases, but to treat distal radius fractures appropriately, you have to. You have not only to cross the flexion creases, but you have to release the flexor carpi radialis tendon sheath as distal as, as you can. You have to follow the tendon into that groove on the trapezium. And most uh, of the human flexor capri idealis tendons are actually attached to the trapezium by these fibers that we call the fibers of Mercer, because Dr. Mercer uh, published this exactly this January, 2023. And she described this uh, interesting uh, insertion that almost every person has into the trapezium that prevents any um, uh, excursion of the FCR at this level. So from a biomechanical perspective, the flexor capriadialis inserts into the trapezium. So you have to release these fibers. And when you release these fibers, now you can move your flexor capriadialis and your median nerve and the rest of the flexor tendons all the way only and gain, and gain that beautiful exposure that allows you to treat your fracture. You can get to the volar rim of the lunate fossa from that radial sided incision. You don't have to make a separate incision between the ulnar neurovascular bundle and the flexor tendons. Now, by going distally, you can get all the way ulnarly, and there is your watershed line. We have to know the anatomy. We have to know that the watershed line runs right over the volar rim of the lunate fossa, that you don't see it when you expose the volar radius, you feel it. It's covered by this thick periosteum called the transitional fiber zone. And you have to release then the intermuscular septum. I like to use my blade in a horizontal fashion from proximal to distal, right at the edge of the brachioradialis, continue all the way radially, open the first compartment so I can mobilize the tendon. I apply my self-retainer against the tendon so I'm not pu pu pushing on the nerve or the artery. And then I will release the brachioradialis in the majority of the older cases because it's contracted. And Sarmiento told us many years ago, the brachioradialis is the prime deforming force of the distal radius fracture. Here we are lifting the transitional fiber zone. Then the perineal quadratus comes up and then you have your whole volar radius exposed. Trick number four, reach to the other side. Most of these fractures are dorsally displaced. The dorsal periosteum is usually intact, it's foreshortened, and it has accumulated a hematoma that usually is organized. And this is exactly um, what Charlie told us in, the, in, the, in his book on the conservative treatment of fractures. The thing is that if we just try to reduce by close uh, manipulation in these more uh, inveterate fractures, say 10 days, two weeks old, it's almost impossible to get the length and the volar tilt because that hematoma is an impediment to reduction. And that's why so many surgeons apply their plates off the bone, proud, and injure the flexor tendon. The, the secret here is to eliminate that dorsal hematoma to allow the radius to get back to its original length. And to do that, we have to do one thing that proved to be very difficult to convince everybody. And that's to pronate the proximal fragment out of the way to get to the dorsal aspect of the fracture. So by putting some tension on your fingers and pronating the proximal fragment out of the way, you can get to the dorsal aspect. Most common reason to do this is simply evacuate that hematoma. You can also treat some articular displacement in this manner. It's not trivial. It's some of these cases are quite difficult, but it's possible to do. And this all has been described uh, since 2001 in, uh, the, um, in the techniques of upper extremity surgery. Uh, and the, the uh, approach is called the extended FCR approach.
And this is a short video just showing you uh, the actual surgical approach. So you start right over the tuberosity of the trapezium. You make your dart, uh, crossing the flexion creases, come proximally over the flexor carpi radialis, open now the, the superficial part of the sheath. There's our um, superficial radial artery. Preserve it, it's very big in this case. And now you release the sheath all the way proximally and all the way distally, and then retract the tendon, and now incise the floor of the sheath. So, so basically the FCR is in a separate compartment. You have to open the, the, the superficial and deep leaves of that compartment. To get your bearings is not a bad idea to identify your flexor pollicis longus. Now you know you're safe. If you release that septum between flexor pollicis longus and flexor carpi radialis, that's completely safe. You're deep to the median nerve, deep to the motor branch, and now you can obtain the exposure. Many times, the most distal fibers of origin of the flexor pollicis longus have to be released so you can apply a properly uh, uh, sized plate. And there's a synovial reflection between the carpal tunnel and the space of parona that has to be open to get full exposure. Horizontal use of the scalpel right over the edge of the brachioradialis and from proximal to distal exposing until you see the radial artery, protect the radial artery, then open up the first compartment, release the contents of the first compartment and then mobilize the tendons and get them out of the way. Now the brachioradialis, which is the prime deforming force of the radius, has to be released. And the best way to do it is to release it from the proximal fragment, on you know, basically the, from the periosteal attachment and leave it hanging from the distal fragment at, at which time you make a step cut. So now you have detached the force well, you can always repair it on the way out, side to side. Feeling for the volar rim of the lunar fossa. I can't see my watershed line, but I can feel it. It's somewhere in there. And now with the scalpel, I lift that thick periosteum uh, proximal to the watershed line. Everything that is proximal to the watershed line is now elevated, so I can see my pronator fossa completely bare. And the muscle then comes up. And this is the time that the uh, key elevator comes in handy. And now <clears throat> what we have accomplished is a good exposure of the volar surface of the radius. But to get to the dorsal side, sometimes we have to release a little bit of the radial periosteum. And with a nice bone holding clamp, we pronate the proximal fragment out of the way and then we can do our debridement. The proximal fragment gets a blood supply from the anterior interosseous artery, so you're not devascularizing. In really uh, old cases, and the periosteum is already contracted, you can excise a strip of periosteum to allow uh, re restoring volar tilt and length. And once you've mobilized everything, it's very every, the reduction is very easy to maintain, and I will then repair the soft tissues, including the transitional fiber zone, which takes suture very well, but with your brachioradialis repaired, now you can repair your pronator too, because there's give on the repaired uh, brachioradialis and it doesn't rupture, it doesn't pull out like it used to in the past. Now I find volar fractures, the ones that we were treating with plates uh, when I was a resident to be the most difficult ones because I cannot pronate the proximal fragment out of the way. The obliquity is wrong. If I try to pronate, I can't. So in these cases, it's, the approach is different. We have to lift the distal fragment up and evacuate the hematoma to get your reduction. And that's easier said than done. That volar uh, uh, thin uh, uh, cortex often breaks when you lift it up. And many times you have to work inside the joint from that volar approach. And it is, of course, totally possible, but it's more difficult than dorsal fractures. Other tricks, the reduction maneuver. Once your plate is applied to the proximal fragment, pull on the fingers, apply your thumb to the uh, already uh, attached plate to the proximal fragment. And with your fingers, you do this pincer type of motion, 
and push the distal fragments against the plate. The plate will give you those more or less 10 degrees of volar tilt, and it will allow you to hold your reduction with one hand as you drill with the other hand. Do not commit to the first one. Do not accept your first reduction if it's not perfect. This is a highly comminuted fracture. We try to fix it the first time. It's not perfect. We keep on trying until we get it right. I particularly like to apply my temporary fixation K wires through the plate for several reasons. First of all, it gives you great stability of your distal fragments. But number two, it tells you if the plate is properly centered. It tells you if the, if, if the screws are going to be right below the subchondral bone where you want them to be. You can predict before you drill uh, a large hole that your reduction is absolutely perfect. And optimal plate placement means your screw should be uh, right below the subchondral bone. Your volar rim, your volar edge of the plate should be about two millimeters proximal to the watershed line. And if you do that, you should get pretty much an anatomical reduction. Now you have to consider your reduction from every possible angle. The first thing we reduce is always the central column, the lunate fossa. It gives you the most stability, but you have to make sure that first K wire is not in the DRUJ. It has to be right going out through the dorsal ulnar corner. Once this, the uh, this lunate fossa is stabilized in space, then it's easy to reduce your scaphoid fossa to your lunate fossa fragment and fix it with another K wire. Hopefully, it goes out the very tip of the styloid. Now, to completely assure that your ulnar sided screws and K wires will not be in the joint, now we have different radiographic views. There are these axial views. My favorite one is the extended tangential view because that one is done in the fracture table. In the, in, sorry, in the hand table, you're operating with a forearm in supination. You simply flex the elbow up until your um, the palm of your hand hits the mini fluoro, and that's when you take your x-ray. And it, it really helps assess that your uh, screws and K-wires will not be in the joint. Rule number eight, assure yourself a good support structure, secret in life. And that is what we do with volar fixed angle plating. We have to create a scaffold underneath the subchondral bone. So this way you don't have to go after each little fragment and you know, perform interfragmentary fixation. All you do is create a scaffold that holds the articular surface in space. You must avoid pitfalls at all costs. We went volar not to injure extensor tendons, but if your screws are too long, you can still injure extensor tendons. You can injure flexor tendons if your plate is not flat on the bone surface. In this particular case, the surgeon did not see in his fluoroscopic view that his plate was proud. He probably did not elevate the transitional fiber zone. He placed the plate over soft tissue. And the end result of that was a flexor pollicis longus rupture that we had to reconstruct. But there are some problems that are really like the Achilles heel. And to me, the worst is the volar rim of the lunar fossa. This is one of my cases from 2004. This is the old DVR. I was very proud. It looked like an anatomical reduction, but a few weeks later, everything had collapsed. The volar marginal fragment had reabsorbed. The plate was articulating against the lunate. So we must watch out for these volar marginal fragments. They are many times avascular. So it's not a matter of reducing, it's a matter of reducing them, fix them rigidly so they can revascularize like a proximal pole of the scaphoid. Suspect volar marginal fragments in volar fractures. The incidence is much higher in volarly directed fractures. And you have one of them over here. And now the treatment is um, pretty effective if you're able to stabilize them initially. And always have a plan B. Sometimes if your fracture is really very old, that one of these nascent malunions that might be two or three months old, the forces to reduce them are so great that you cannot do it in the conventional manner. You must apply the plate to the distal fragment first and then lever your reduction down. <clears throat> Don't forget that there are other methods of treatment that you should be able to pull them from the bag as you need them. Don't forget that for terrible injuries where there really is no, no radius to fix, you can always use a spanning plate to temporize the situation and come back 
another day for victory. And <clears throat> have confidence on the volar approach. This might look like a dorsal Barton fracture, but our experience has shown that all these axial injuries, they usually have, if anything, a non-displaced volar fracture line that can be opened and then converted into an extended FCR approach, allowing uh, you to obtain that anatomical reduction that you so want. And not every single case is easy. This is my uh, case from two weeks ago. I did this with my daughter, who is a um, magnificent or orthopedic surgeon better than me. Uh, this patient had fell from a stair, had fracture blisters, had this uh, uh, articular uh, fracture pattern. We did a, a, a CAT scan showing you that there is bone all over the place. I don't know how that bone got so far away from where it's supposed to be, but this was like an explosion injury. So, and this is the, the uh, <clears throat> regular uh, CAT scan showing you the defect in the articular surface. So what do we do? How do we treat this? Same as everybody else. Pronate that radius out of the way, the breed, reduce the fragments that you have and do your best. So this is my first attempt, terrible. I, that's not an anatomical reduction. That's my second attempt, a little better. I don't have the volar tilt. So I pull my, my, my plate back a little bit, attempt my reduction once again. And that, this is the, the reduction maneuver. So my, my thumb is over the plate, the plate is applied to the proximal fragment. On my, my left hand fingers are over the distal fragment and reducing the fracture to the plate. And with my right hand, I'm pushing the styloid fossa fragment into the central column. And then um, the other surgeon comes in with a K wire and makes sure it doesn't put the K wire through my finger. And we obtain this maybe not perfect, but good enough reduction. So in conclusion, volar lock plating of the distal radius fracture is not a trivial operation. Mastering the technique will allow us to better serve our patients. Thank you very much for your attention.